Oh boy, oh boy, we made it to issue 50, barely. From the negative zone, up and down, battling a nihilist, ultimate nullifier, it's all there. Steve, what do you say? Mom! Oh. Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Welcome, everybody, to issue 50 of the Stephen Semino Says Boom Show. Look at me and Roy all squished together in our little comic corner box <laughs> that Steve Dicko invented. <laughs> we got Steve. We got Niall. Hey, issue 50. Niall, tell us what to do because we don't have a clue. 50 years old. Well, I'll tell you what, everyone. Look below, click that subscribe button, and smash that bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content like this 50th episode and tonight we're hanging out with roy so gentlemen take it away steve 50 episodes in what do you think you know it just seems sort of incredible it seems like only yesterday we were talking about oh we're at issue nine we're getting ready for issue 10 and like it's like uh, pretty soon we're going to be on issue 500 what are we going to do <laughs> can you imagine now everybody like i said we're at roy's domain so roy lives literally across between the sanctum sanctorium the negative zone there's something it's all cosmic crazy so our phone has to work like this but we're here and it doesn't matter about me it matters about him because with our issue 50 we are going to do the one of the greatest now one of the greatest comic reviews of all time. Now, why I love this so much, in 1976, this was story of the year. Roy was, uh, George Perez was artist of the year, and Roy came in second, I'm sorry, he was editor of the year, but you came in second for writer of the year by one vote. I don't know if you know that. By a, you were right behind Denny O'Neill. Stan sold me out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to know, what issue we're talking about, Niall, show. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, I love this cover. Now, oh. this is great. Now, I'm going to get out of the screen, and Roy's going to do a page-by-page -page account. Before we get into it, Steve, what do we got to say about this issue? You know, as the years pass, this issue grows and grows and grows for me because – yeah, we all like our really serious comics with the melodrama and people dying and the whoa. But this story always leaves me with a, a a real beautiful sensation at the end. It's just a real feel-good story, and it's actually something that they can't do anymore. I love this story. And, and that's so true. And, Roy, before you get into talking about this issue, Tell us the, the the problem with the impossible man, because this was the first time he came back. Tell us a little behind yeah. the scenes about this issue. Yeah. Well, he had been in the, what, the preceding one issue, or if not two, uh, helping to, uh, against Galactus. What was it? Galactus ate his planet and burped himself to death for a while or something. I don't know. But anyway, what happened is that uh, when, of course, uh, the impossible man had been in, what was it, issue number 11 of Fantastic Four, uh, and it was just one story out of two stories in an issue. And he was, but he was the cover feature, you know, kind of menacing on the cover. But the story was kind of silly, you know. This the, the Apostle Man is this crazy guy who can do almost anything from a, from another planet. The Fantastic Four can't get rid of, rid of him, so finally they just make him bored so that he leaves. It's the only thing they can do. Well, I thought that was a wonderfully cute little story when I read it at the age of 
whatever I was, 21, 22, uh, and so forth. But as it turned out, the uh, the readership, which was you know younger then than it would have been you know 10 or 20, 20 years later, uh, the, the the young readership, which would have averaged out in the low teens, say or whatever it was, didn't really like the story at all. They got evidently more bad mail and hate mail on this story, saying that you know what are you doing with this stupid story? What kind of a villain is the Impossible Man? And he, you know, and and this and that. And so when I came there. Uh, you know, several years later, one of the and I began to write Fantastic Four stories a few years after that. One of the first things I wanted to do, since he had never been back, is I wanted to bring back the Impossible Man. Uh, and this is about the time Howard the Duck was making a little bit of a splash too. So I figured, you know, maybe it's time to, uh, you know, to, you know, bring back the Impossible Man. But Stan. Had all he had actually, I'd been trying it off and on in other books besides the Fantastic Four, and Stan would never let me do it because he said, "No, it's just asking for trouble. The readers hate it. It won't, it won't sell. People won't like it. Nobody can do it right, you know, and so forth." And uh, so he just absolutely would not allow that character to be used. It looked for how long was it? it was uh, about uh, really almost a decade and a half in between the first and second Impossible Man story, and that was you know all down to Stan. Uh, luckily, by the middle 70s, while Stan was still around, he was the, the publisher and so forth, but he wasn't keeping quite as top of reign on things. I, you know, I, I had been the editor in chief and now I was the, the editor of the comics I wrote anyway. And, you know, he trusted my judgment enough. So he, so he sort of let it go. I think I had to clear it with him, but he, I think he just shrugged, you know, and said, all right, you're asking for it or something like that. That was the end of it. And I never discussed it with him again, so I don't know if he ever paid any attention to that story or, or not. I never heard any reaction from him on it. And it just so happened to be about the time that George Perez, as a young artist, was just kind of kind of coming into his own. He would make a much bigger splash on other books besides the Fantastic Four, but he had just come in. He was still being by Joe Sinnott, who would give it the uh, uh, the kind of the extra little power it needed. And I was just in a mood to write a little different story after. You know, it's sort of like when they did the original Galactus trilogy and then they followed it up with that weird story in the negative zone, you know, as an offbeat story. It became like one of the, you know, the most reprinted stories, right? And somehow or other, people needed a break after the Galactus trilogy back in 1965, 66. Maybe it was true here, too. And this was the, the story that I had done with uh, George and maybe John DeSimmons and so forth, two or three issues. Is that the one that started off with the Golden Gorilla? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Not, yeah, cool. Cool. yeah. As, as a cover blurb that that's, uh, <laughs> Scott Shaw is always kidding you about that I was so proud of. Not just another giant gorilla story, you know. <laughs> there so many of those. But anyway, so I, so even then I wasn't taking it too seriously. I wouldn't have made up the idea of a yellow gorilla as the uh, herald of blackness. But you know, I thought it, it was time to try something a, a few things a little different. The story was still serious, but when it was done, I just guess I was in a mood for something a little different, and uh, I knew George. George was the kind of guy he could draw a big spectacular action, but he was also the master of the little touches. You know, the little touches, you know, drawing whether it's a, a little tiny thing, any little detail you want to draw, or any, any number of people, crowds, whoever you wanted to draw, whatever you wanted to draw, George was game, you know. <clears throat> and uh, we lost a real talent when he passed away, you know, some months ago. But um, so we didn't know this was, story was going to turn out the way it did. In fact, this cover is kind of intriguing because uh, I was very happy to get a chance to have Jack Kirby do his the second his second Impossible Man cover, you know, uh, for this. And Jack, uh, just knowing the general idea of the story, the Impossible Man was fighting the Fantastic Four. He had him using all the various powers of the Marvel heroes. He's got Thor's hammer and what he's stretching and doing this and that. He's using two or three different powers of other heroes, which is not anything that that George and I have intended to put in the story we had discussed, but George saw it when he was about a third or halfway drawing it through drawing it, so he included this. So Jack actually, in a way, he was an honorary artist of the issue because he influenced the art in the uh, last half of the story uh, and so forth. So it was a just a you know a wonderful you know combination, and it's it's one of the certainly the fantastic story of mine that gets reprinted the most, and it seems like they've reprinted it five or ten different times in different places. And I, you know, I was very, you know, I was very happy with it. So, Roy, would you like to take us on a journey through issue 176? Nah, that's all right. No, no, I'll do it. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, page by excruciating page. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I have to be looking down because I have my 
copy of the Marvel Masterworks Fantastic or Volume 17 here, and I'll be looking there. Um, it starts off with uh, just a close up of the thing, but with a lot of nice shadows on him because uh, he's very unhappy because, you know, uh, I had decided to turn him to turn him back into just Ben Grimm and so that he could also be the thing. I had him wearing an exoskeleton suit of the thing for a while. And that way I, you know, it was, it, it was not intended to be forever, but the idea was you could have Ben Grimm and he could be Ben Grimm and he could still be the thing in a little different way. And it was just an attempt to, uh, you know, it wasn't going to last forever, but it was an attempt to just do something a little different with the character. But of course, naturally, because Ben Grimm is never, you know, never one destined to be happy. Now he's grousing about the fact that, uh, you know, he's back being the thing again, you know. I want an exoskeleton of Steve on top of me. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, okay, that, next... that splash page is yeah? beautiful. It, I, I would have to say that George, for me, is second only to Jack when it comes to the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Okay, next page now. Okay. I'm not sure exactly. I'm trying to think what's special. Here he's just talking about, you know, this is kind of funny, you know. Uh, he's I tore out of your precious exoskeleton like Doc Savage, rip of the T-shirt, you know. Just <laughs> I, I was trying to set up right away the idea that this story was going to be kind of self-referential and a, a little bit less than serious, so that instead of saying something else, he refers to Doc Savage, another another uh, you know Marvel character at that particular time. And uh, other than that, it's just you know the the Human Torch and the thing are back to fighting, and at this stage, it's just kind of a typical. Fantastic Four story. If it had gone on this way for another five or ten pages, nobody would have ever thought anything more about it. Okay, next page now. Okay, we get a little bit of a flash, uh, a flashback, and uh, again, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of think some funny, kind of funny lines, like, uh, you know, uh, Mister Fantastic says, you know, Ben shouldn't worry about not being handsome. He says, was, was Albert Einstein a matinee idol? Or Schweitzer, or even DiMaggio. <laughs> Nowadays, I don't, I don't think anybody knows who Albert Schweitzer was anymore. But uh, DiMaggio might still be remembered by a few people, and uh, Albert Einstein, anyway. And uh, but again, the whole idea was this: this page was just to introduce finally the uh, the Impossible Man, who they've kind of forgotten is kind of a stowaway on board their uh, their ship. They had not meant to bring him back to Earth. God knows, but <laughs> here he is. Next page now. So there he is, you know, he's, he's, he has the ability to turn into pretty much anything. So here he is as some sort of little piece of machinery on the ship. And then he, he pops up, the thing tries to get him, but of course he just makes himself, uh, you know, like an open space and so forth. And anyway, so they're about to, they're about to crash. And again, yeah, this is just like the typical stuff of these first few pages. Being a kind of a typical Fantastic Four story to get down to earth till the weird stuff starts happening. Next page now. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a nice shot where uh, I think where uh, the spaceship is headed down towards Central Park. It's, you know, it's a nice uh, that's a nice feeling there. But again, it's just uh, you know they're they're in a life or death situation, thinking they're going to crash, and of course the Impossible Man, you know, you think he's just this little spiny, uh, spindly you know character, but he's absolutely indestructible. So you know they they may be destroyed they may just take half the earth with him but the impossible man will be okay <laughs> and he, he's already getting bored uh, before he's even landed on earth yet next page now okay well okay uh there's just some more he, he, he just decides to watch from outside and uh mostly this is given over to the human torch stopping the ship from uh crashing and putting it into the uh, the lake in the middle of central park we, we like doing this i think we, you know, uh, Stan and Jack and others did this too, but but uh, George and I here, we were trying to really set this in New York City. So we, we you know, we, we make it Central Park, and you got the lake in Central Park, and you have people around there. And I think this had more of a feeling of New York, at least that area of New York, than the average uh, story even. Next page now. Okay, so okay, so now you're getting into uh, back in Fun City, which is. Believe it or not, it's hard to imagine now, but that's actually what they did call New York for a few years back then. Fun city, hard to imagine now. But anyway, and and a little here's a little piece of information that I forgot that I evidently tossed into the last panel on this page. Uh, he says, 
That was the last checkered cab in sight. They're the only ones in town that carry more than four passengers at one time. And I knew, I just knew that all the readers of Marvel Comics were just waiting to know that little bit of lore about uh, you know New York cabbies. But actually, it sets up a thing for the story because you've got five characters. You know, you've got the Fantastic Four and the Impossible Man. So they need a cab that will carry more than four people. Most cabs will, in the city would not carry more than four passengers. So they have to to uh, get one of the checkered ones. Now, if you ask me now that question, I wouldn't, have, wouldn't know that. But I knew that in 1976 because I was there all the time. <laughs> and, and I decided, and we, you know, George and I made it somehow or other, you know, it, we must have conferred on this because we made it like a major point of the story for the next page or two. So we, must, I don't remember our conference. We just talked over for a little bit, but you know, we must have talked this over and come up with this. Next page yeah. now? Because then you go through all these permutations the guy's trying to, first he says, well, you know, there's, okay, there's, uh, there's five of you. So he, they end up having to get a cab. Uh, they end up having to get a cab that will only take four because they can't get the checkered cab. So they stop that cab. He says, you know, he says, well, there's, there's five of you. And it's because the impossible man has joined them. And then, then it's kind of a cute touch. You know, we had, they, they have to have four people get the cab. So soon disappears, <laughs> turns invisible. <laughs> So they're, they're so the basically the Fantastic Four are cheating now. You know they're cheating the cabbie. You know making him take them uh, <laughs> five people in a four person cab. I guess she's sitting on his lap or whatever. And uh, let's see. And you know again a reference to Mayor Beam. So yeah, there's all this history in there. Who who's the mayor at the time? I kind of forgot Mayor Beam. I think he was about three feet tall, as I recall. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and uh, so we're and all of a sudden now he's only got three characters in there because she's still invisible and. The Apostle Man has disappeared and says, hey, I never had me no green booties hanging from my mirror before because the, the, <laughs> because the, green, the Apostle Man has turned into, into a, you know, the guy, people always had That's, dice or something. Yeah, like yeah. So, so George just drew uh, drew him turned into there. I don't think that George and I discussed every little thing, just that he was going to be doing all this crazy stuff. I don't, some of these things are just things George tossed in. Some of them are the major plot that we had discussed before. But George threw in a lot of things on his own. Next page, you know? So now... Here we have, you know, the usual thing, crashes. They can make a good scene out of this in a movie. And, uh, oh, and, and here's my Ratso Rizzo uh, scene out the end. I was always happy with this. Remember in, in uh, Midnight Cowboy? You know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dustin Hoffman as Ratso Rizzi. You know, he, he starts to cross the street at a, at a, a car. Almost hits him and just screams because it wasn't paying attention to pedestrians. And, and he stops and he says, pounds on the car. He says, I'm walking here. You remember that? You know? <laughs> and I wanted to do my, my kind of thing. So I said, well, you know, if you were the thing, you wouldn't just say, I'm walking here. You would reach into the guy's car straight through the hood <laughs> and, hand, and hand him his motor. You know, I mean, <laughs> that was the thing, his version of Ratso Rizzi, which was, you remember, this was, you know, just a few years before now. Just stop for a second, Roy. What I love about this is that it's all lovable Fantastic Four stuff. Like it's just all the reasons why and what's missing today. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nan. Because I love the, uh, you know, the thing is was is my favorite Marvel character to write. You know, really. And uh, so you know, I uh, so I was just having a lot of fun with this. And, oh yeah. And everything. It was always he was always fun to write. But when you get him in humorous situations and where he's exasperated, it's even better. You know. Okay. So now we're. Okay, so now we now we finally get to the the meat of the story as far as there is any. Okay, they're oh, right there on the sixth floor. See, I wouldn't have known what floor in, in, in that particular. We were we moved up and down Madison Avenue to about three or four different floors during the ten years, eleven years I lived in New York. Uh, just within two or three blocks, the the joke running around the office was that Martin Goodman, the the original publisher, moved the office depending on how much exercise his doctor told him to get. Now, by this time, <laughs> Martin Newman was no longer there. Stan was running the show, but it was, we were still moving up and down Madison Avenue, it seems. So now we're at 575, and we're on the sixth floor. I, I just learned yesterday that evidently at another building, we were on the third floor, right below the National Lampoon, which was on the fourth floor when they got their, their bomb threat that time. So, so, so by the bottom of the panel uh, page, you get a... Uh, the, the, the drawing seems a little... Stranger, the heads and things are just a little, little larger. Just trying to draw this. I don't, I don't know if the, the body proportions are quite right, but the the effect is really great. And it's uh, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, George Perez, and Roy Thomas—four people who were never in their entire lives ever in the same room. I can, I'm 
almost 100% sure of that. <laughs> but here we are as if Jack has just flown in from the coast, and boy, are his arms tired. And, uh, you know, and of course, they're in Stan's office with all these pictures up of the Hulk and the Vision, which Stan, of course, didn't have in his office. And we're all talking back and forth, and a mention of Joe Sinnott so that he wouldn't feel left out. I, I mentioned Joe's waiting for pages yeah. and things like that. And uh, so, and, so Jack says, uh, hey, I got an idea what to do. And then we turn to the next page. Next page now? He says, why don't you two lads, meeting me and George, why don't you two lads just make up some stories about the Fantastic Four? Now, this is going back to an early motif in the Fantastic Four in which there was an authorized, which had been forgotten for some years, I think, mostly, in which there was an authorized Fantastic Four comic that, you know, originally was drawn by, what, Lee and Kirby back in, like, Fantastic Four, was it number 10 or so, where Dr. Doom came in? When Stan and Jack are there oh, in the office, and, yes. you know, and then, you know, when they were sort of characters, and you know, like Stan and Jack trying to go to uh, the wedding of Reed and Sue and that kind of thing. And it lasted for two or three years. But but then the idea that there were official comic books about the Fantastic Four, forget about Spider-Man or anybody else, that kind of it was a little easier when it was just the Fantastic Four. You could sort of believe the Fantastic Four doing that. But, you know. The idea of there being a whole Marvel comics in New York that also had all the Marvel superheroes actually running around was pretty absurd. So I figured, well, this is just an absurd story. So we're going to ignore the fact that this doesn't make any sense and that it couldn't really happen. We're just going to treat it as if it makes sense, you know. So we so we did, and uh, so you know, so George and I react very amazed at the idea we make up stories. I mean, what do you mean? We just been recording this stuff that really happens. We just write these stories down and find out what happens. And Stan says, you know, I, I say, I'll make up some, I'll write some made up stories. And George says, I'll make up some supervillains. And Stan says, you two sound like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. You know, old, again, some of our audience probably didn't know, but that's an old reference, of course, to these 1940s movies in which they, they were always going to, Mickey and Judy would get together and put on a show in about five movies in a row. So, uh, Anyway, uh, you know, and, and the funny thing is that the the whole reason that Stan wouldn't let me do the fan or anybody else, but I don't think anybody else asked to do the impossible for all those years is used actually in here as the rationale. Stan says, "No, oh, we already did that guy years ago." You know, because because uh, Impossible Man says, "I want my own comic book," and Stan says, "We already put him in one. And it didn't work out. We're not going to do any more because he looked too silly." You know, which is, of course, pretty much what really happened. But the Impossible Man, who, who this time was alive to object uh, to this, he, he he objects very much, very strenuously to that, and he start he proceeds to tear up the office in his anger. Look at that middle, the middle panel in the last, the, the oh, yeah. in the panel. You got Roy saving Stan from him. <laughs> you saved him. Stan used to say, "I saved his life." This is my version of showing, you know, actually, uh, George drawing me actually doing it. <laughs> Next page now. Yeah, the next bit. Now George gets his chance to save Stan next because he's. I got the man. He says. He, <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm trying to hold the door open. And it bangs out, and then we get to some more. Now, again, I don't know that. I don't know if we discussed all this, but uh, uh, George decided to draw in report. Well, report. John report. The production manager uh, was, you know, a. I mean, he was a big guy. He was six foot, several inches tall. He he weighed, you know, various times up to three hundred and something pounds, and everything, and. Just an enormous, gentle giant kind of guy, always going around, gruff voice and uh, smoking his pipe and so forth. This is a pretty good likeness of it there in panel five. And so I don't know if there was any great reason to put John in, but George just decided, you know, everybody dealt with, with John. Everybody kind of liked him. Or most people did anyway, if you didn't have too much trouble with him. So they, so they threw him in for a few panels. That's kind of nice because I think that's about one of the few times John, who died a year or two later, ever made it into the comic books. That's enough of that, I guess. Okay, next page now? Yeah, that, this one's just, uh, you know, a bunch of action with them trying to stop him. And that, this this is the this must be the point where, by this point, Jack's cover has come in, which has Impossible Man turning his one of his fists into Thor's hammer. So there you see it in uh, panel four there. Uh, you know, this is... Now, you, if, if you were just reading the story and you knew the way Marvel usually did it with the covers being drawn last after the story was done, you'd think that Jack drew that because it was in the story. But in this particular case, it was the other way around. And, uh, you know, there's no way to know that except that that's just the way it was. So anyway, and uh, Impossible Man is trying to, trying to come up with a good expression. It is time to clobber, is it not? You know? <laughs> you know? So, again, you just, you know, a lot of violence, but just the dialogue was the, kind of deliberately. Uh, Next selling. page now? 
This is a favorite page of mine because of panel two. Uh, this is something that, right. George, that I think George just decided to toss this in. Yep. It's, it's hard to see on the screen, but th but the door to the editor in chief, it says editor, and it's got all the names of the editors in the order in which they had in, the, in which they had uh, been editor in the last you know in, in recent years. Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, and there each one is crossed out because you know it's uh, because it's been superseded. Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Len Wein, Marv Wolfman. Uh, sure. Oh, oh, let's see. Oh, no. Then it's then after after Wolfman, it's Roy T H O because I because in early '76, in February '76, I agreed to come back in as editor in chief, but I never did. I decided to move. I went out to California, liked it there, and I decided to move there. So they didn't even get around to finishing putting my name. They only got the first six out of the nine letters up on the door. <laughs> and I was gone. On. This is you well, know, no, there's no way anyone else would know that. And then, so yeah. this, this was just George putting that Roy Tom. You know, they didn't even finish my name before I was gone. And then we have Jerry Conway. Well, I'm surprised his name is finished. He was only there a few weeks as editor chief before he was gone, just barely long enough to finish his name. And then uh, Archie Goodwood, who was the editor at that time. And then it says uh, your name here or something. You're, you know, if it actually put it, it would be uh, Jim Shooter about a year later and so forth. But that he would be the next name. But that, that was a, just a funny little you know gag on there. I, I'm pretty sure that George put that on. I could have, I could have written it on if it was an empty door and put it on. Maybe I did, but I, but I, I suspect George probably did it. I'll, I'll give him the credit on that one. Then you got uh, what else? We, he worked in a few more people. Here's Archie Goodman wandering around trying to figure out what alliterative. Uh, name he has is he artful archie or articulate archie or what you know and that's that's all that uh, the art direct the, the editor-in-chief has to do right there you know? well so many of us were were uh writer editors at that point he, he wasn't in charge of quite as many comics as, as he could be and and he runs it so we got at least one shot of len Wein and uh, uh not quite as good a shot maybe for me to but uh and everything but they're both in there along with uh you know, there's a comic book with Galactus on the cover. And there's there's Invisible Girl, Woman, and uh, Human Torch, and a poster of Doctor Strange, all in one little tiny panel, I mean, and so forth. You know, so and this is my favorite line on this page. Uh, I had Johnny Storm saying, "He shrunk down as small as Joe Rosen's lettering." <laughs> <laughs> and I love this because I always tried to get first Sam and even more so Joe Rosen, his brother, when he sort of took over. Uh, because they lettered smaller than Artie Simic or anybody and worked really well. They didn't do sound effects quite as well as Artie, but they, although he may have passed away by this time, but anyway, but Joe Rosen did this wonderful lettering so that you could, you could put more copy on a page and it didn't cover up quite as much. So I was, I wanted to have a little reference to Joe Rosen, just like we did to Joe Sinnott, you know, and everything, work everybody into the book. All right. Next page now. Yeah. Then, uh, then he's, then he's still going on there, talk, still talking about you know getting, him getting a comic. So so they have to hogtie Stan Archie. Archie finally says arduous Archie. He's still trying to think of a name for himself, a alliterative name. And, uh, and here's a, now here's a panel in the middle. For some reason, you know, uh, worked in. I, I, I guess I figure out that's Jerry Conway. I don't know if I'd recognize him otherwise, but uh, he did have a beard at the time. Jerry Conway is in one panel, uh, and there may be somebody else in there that, that I don't. There's a guy over. Archie Goodwin's reading. He's coming up with another name, Armadillo Archie, which makes even less sense than the others. And uh, but anyway, the main thing here is that they've they have uh, they threaten the thing threatens Stan into he's got to do a comic about the Impossible Man because they got to find some way to keep him happy or whatever. And uh, oh, and here's uh, Roger. This would be Roger uh, Slifer, I guess, coming in. He, Roger was a relatively new hire then. At, at the and bottom, he comes in at the bottom. I'm Roger, and I was practicing my proofreading. <laughs> yeah, well, I, we all got what we did up there. So he, so he gives it to him, and, and finally, uh, an Impossible Man is so happy that he's a comic book superhero, he's never going to leave this planet again, which, of course, is just exactly what everybody does not want. Not, next yeah. page now? And then we have uh, an ad in the paper, which is setting up the next <laughs> issue, which I, no, so, which I had almost as fun with as this one. The five for four are now accepting applicants for membership at the Baxter Building, former headquarters of the Super Fantastic Four. No previous supervillain group experience necessary. And are you a bona fide supervillain in search of togetherness? So that's that's that was a, a setup for the next issue. But meanwhile, you've got uh, 
uh, they go flying off. Uh, the Apostle Man turns himself into some kind of vehicle. They go flying away. And I, I say to Stan that I, I will have to, George and I will have to get started on that story about the Apostle Man. And Stan says, what story? That promise was made under duress. That's the way Stan was thought, too. You know? and we're not, and, and then, but and this was nice. And Pam says, never, he says, Marvel Comics hasn't got time to waste on silly looking characters. Is he, just as he's striding past a picture of Howard the Duck. <laughs> you know, so it's impossible, man. So, uh, and so that's, that's the end of that page. But that's the end of the story. I don't know. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll have something else. Then we get to the last page. <laughs> And all, all the last page does is, you know, really introduce the fact that they come up with a new, you know, fight for four. But there are only three of them, but they're there to uh, interview for the others. And that's that's where the uh, Captain Ultra came in. It was one of yes. the <laughs> made yeah. wonderful, wonderful superhero with all the powers in the world, except one little thing. He was allergic to fire. So if you struck a match within a mile of it, you keeled over, which was really just to take off on the Martian Manhunter over at... Uh, DC, who was like Superman, but except he was allergic to fire or something. And who else? Was, oh, there's another one, Mike Friedrich. When I was down at a convention in Texas, I was shared by a couple of conventions in Dallas and Houston that year. And at one of them, I was with Mike Friedrich and a few other people. And Mike suggested, we, we, I was talking about that story I was going to do, I guess, you know, with the, uh, uh, it, it, the that next one. It was basically his takeoff. You remember the Legion of Substitute Heroes? Yes. Yeah. The Legion of Superheroes. They had the guys who weren't quite. I always thought the Legion of Superheroes was just like the worst comic I in the world. I hated it, right? But the only thing that was worse was they had a Legion of Substitute Heroes. If you weren't quite good enough to join to be one of the 40 or 50 members of the Legion of Superhero, Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl, and that stuff, you could, you know, you could become one of these Substitute Heroes who would occasionally be able to save the day. You know, like what I don't care, was Bouncing Boy, you know, whoever it is, doing the dams and whatever. No, she started with three people who could kill so that she was just doing the damn so just, just the worst stuff in the world to me. Paul Levitz and other people were doing it, and I just hated it. So I just wanted to do a mean takeoff on the region of substitute heroes, interviewing to the, the flight before. And that's uh, it was Mike who suggested the Texas Twister. Oh, yeah. It was a Cowboys character that made one or two other things there. But again, this was really a kind of a two part story in a way. But the first part with all the uh, little men people in it. You know, probably the most successful. The other, but the two of them together actually made a story. Wow. Anyway, that's about it. It's just kind of a bunch of silliness that we had to get back to something a little more serious. But I, we, we took it a little slow because that second stuff is too serious either. Okay, Steve, what's your review? What's your take? You know, I love that issue. I just love <laughs> I, I love everything about it. I just love uh, George's pencils are so sharp. He, you compare that with a year ago on the, on the, on the artwork, it's like, it's a different person. It's like, mm -hmm. he's, you know, Roy said it, it himself perfectly coming into his own. He was becoming a superstar. He didn't know it yet. No one else knew it yet. It took a little a while later for him to become the, the, the superstar we know today. But I remember at the time, now remember, I'm not buying these books off the rack. I'm buying issues you know, as back issues and getting bits and pieces. So I bought issue 165, and then I bought issue 176. And I was able to look at it and go, oh, wow, look at, look, at the, look at the quality of the art. This is incredible. So the art, the coloring, this is a perfect example of a comic that's very welcoming. And that last little panel there, where the Frightful Four, they introduced themselves. You don't take it for granted that the readers know who they are, you know? So you you introduce them like on that last page because he says, you know, the wizard says, just in case you've forgotten who we are, I'm the wizard. It's just magnificent. These days, they, you know, everyone, you know, they take things for granted. I love this issue. It's beautifully drawn. The characterization is 100%. The coloring is nice and light. Uh, and it does. It, it The comic of the year, easily. Mm -hmm. Niall? Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, uh, you know, George Prez's lines in this book, I mean, uh, the pencil work, what he put together was just solid. And I loved this issue just for the fact that you you had the Fantastic Four in the Marvel offices and they're interacting so that fictional world meets reality is just, I love that. 
to me it's like you know breaking the fourth wall type thing right it's like bringing the superheroes into reality with you and you get to actually get caricatures and it was cool that how you kind of made fun of yourselves in that book uh with all the with all the creators and everything i just book of the year for sure i mean i i loved it we had to be careful because we didn't want to you know we knew we could continue that so the next issue i don't think we have any uh, more people put it because you know, if we did it too much, it was going to break down, not the fourth wall, it would break down the whole building. You know? but, yeah. Uh, but, you know, but for one issue, we thought we could kind of get away with it. And obviously, you know, obviously we did. The, you know, it was a combination of a good idea, you know, fair, and, you know, fairly well executed and so forth. And people just... Uh, I have to it. say, it was, it was, the art enhanced the story. Like, it's a feel-good story. Yes. But it's so entertaining. But you get the love of the fantastic for the family aspect of it. And then the jovialness of the Marvel bolt in, like, because they're all characters unto themselves. And and then the impossible man, I mean, it's a perfect blender of characters and stuff that just works so perfectly. And I love how you save Stan and then Perez has to stay. I got the man, you know, despite everything that's going on and all the chaos, everybody's saving Stan because he's like the golden goose. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. But who saved, who saved Jack? Nobody saved him. Oh, nobody saved him. Don't save Jack. Oh, no. <laughs> but I have to say this, though. That story I, is one of those stories that you can read over and over and over again. And it's always entertaining because it's not taken serious, but it's so entertaining. And for me, that's the antithesis of what comics should be like that. You don't get that anymore. Steve, no. do you get anything like that at all anymore? No, they, the people working today have no idea of how, how to construct a story like that. They don't, they just don't know it. And this is like, uh, I like to use the analogy of lost technology, lost archaeology, or lost civilization. Because, you know, uh, when I introduce a younger reader to a, like this story, they're like, well, I, I don't understand what's going on because they just they, they can't they can't get their mind around it. But people like me and you, John, we are embedded in that story. And then we can't get into the new way of doing things because it's like they try to do this type of stuff in Deadpool, by the way. Deadpool, very offhand, you know, like slapstick stuff going on. And, you know, and he's breaking the fourth wall. He's, you know, he's actually looking at it. And I actually find it very annoying. There is a there is a limit to what you can do and what you can get away with. And this issue is is it walks that tightrope magnificently, and it's very entertaining. Whereas in a, in you know when you read Deadpool, it's just like they're hitting they're hitting you over the head with a bat, really. The sarcasm. Well, it's, is one thing that's kind of interesting is I don't I don't it, it is that uh, I. I I don't think that we ever have the Fantastic Four talking to the reader, right? I mean, you know, we, we sort of, we did, didn't break the fourth wall, say, in the way that the She-Hulk did, book did later or yes. something like this. But we just we just pretended that, you know, that this earlier version in which Stan and Jack and eventually a wider group of people were doing authorized stories of these superheroes, which has been, you know, that's been used in a lot of different, you know, things before and, and Marvel had used it in the early days. But we didn't put it, for example, we, you, you know, it, it was, I don't think we discussed it. We just automatically knew we shouldn't have the Fantastic Four and not take it seriously. The Fantastic Four don't do anything that isn't take, you know, yes. the whole situation seriously. They're trying to save, you know, the, the Marvel offices, New York, the world, whatever is being menaced on purpose or by accident by the impossible man. And to them, it's a life, it's a serious situation. It's only supposed to be funny if you know that it's a ridiculous situation in which the uh, uh, you know the impossible man is, is is there in the normal offices it doesn't make any sense but the normal offices in that but that's the genius of that issue is the fact that the reader knows it's like kind of old hand it's a little slapsticky and it's like a fun but the fantastic four don't they take it's like it's a serious story within a funny story you know it's it's very that's actually pretty genius what you did there roy and i have to say this roy one of roy's talents is writing funny if you read his not brand x stuff like it's it's such innocent humor but it's funny I, like dan writes well that dan his wife writes very it's hard to write funny 
in, in, in an innocent type of way. If you read, and that's what that is. It's funny. You you laugh a little because of, there's such charm to it. And it's like, once again, the Fantastic Four are taking that seriously. This is a dire situation. I, I'm not really a humor writer. Like, you know, there are people like Mark Epidemius who can write funny comics and so forth. And, you know, Stan was great, you know, proud of it. So. You were not only deservedly so, but you know, but sometimes it was as good as a certain kind of humor. But to me, it was all, I was just trying to, to follow on the kind of thing that Morrow had always done, which was the wise cracks and the not taking things too seriously and so forth. And we just followed that to its logical conclusion, but we were just to see what happened. And then we, we backed away from the abyss because, you know, if you, if you continued on, the whole thing would become a farce and wouldn't be able to take anything seriously. Right. But for one issue, it was kind of not. Nice. But, you know, I can understand that, that some people would look at that and say, you know, they don't understand what the whole story is about because the whole idea of mixing those realities, maybe they're so mixed now that, that the idea of mixing them isn't funny or startling or, or, or whatever to them. I don't know. But then I, I also was hearing just from the, the other day that, that uh, a lot of young people, uh, young kids and so forth, they can't enjoy, say, uh, uh, a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Mm-hmm. You know, that these are as good cartoons as we're ever done in a certain way. And, you know, and I, I guess, you know, humor styles could just change enough that uh, one generation really can't really communicate with the next as to what is funny and what was funny. I actually say this. Steve and Niall, Steve will attest to this. When we were reading those Marvel comics, we wanted to know who Stanley was, who Roy Thomas was, who these guys were. Today, do you think you want to know anybody there in the office? <laughs> Steve, Steve, who are you looking for? Do you yeah, no, yeah. Niall, do you? No. no. That's <laughs> a very valid point. Stars, I mean, if anything, it seems like the star system is alive, well, and thriving. I mean, I, I was looking at some books. They, they put out books and they put the name of the writer bigger than the artist or the artist bigger than the writer or something. You know, there's a real star system. So somebody cares about it. These people as creators, anyway. Well, I don't know if it's the readers because those, those comics aren't even selling. Well, <laughs> I'm talking about the collections. Uh, the collections <laughs> okay, Niall, any last words for this episode? Oh, episode man, 50. A, episode 50. 50 I'm, years old, Steve. And uh, man, this is uh, another great episode. I love when Roy can come on and, and really dissect these books and just give us a whole nother perspective. And, you know, again, this was a fun read. You know, I, this was for me, this was the first time I read it when John sent it over to me. And I was like, this is awesome. And I love George Prez's art in it. It's just actually for, you know, as an artist and for any aspiring artists, um, this is actually a good example of the type of book that take take those pages that George is doing and copy them because his line work is actually phenomenal in it. And, uh, you know, his perspective, um, everything in there is actually great. And, and even the styles that, that he does in that is really is a good foundation. Uh, if you want to start, you know, drawing the human body. And, and Steve, last words here. Did you 50? Um, you know, it's funny, um, you know, and I, I try not to fall into this zone, but um, half of me is always very sad when I finish an issue like this, because to me, this is how comics should be done. And we're never going to see this again. We, we always have to go and, and, and read a reprint or go back. and. The fact that we're, that we're not going to get this again is astounding to me. So on one hand, I'm enjoying it and I'm loving it. I'm like, look at this. And then, I, of course, I love to showcase it to others. But inside is a sort of a sadness that no one can get anywhere near close to replicating the feeling inside that book. That's how much that book and this era means to me. And, and that book is an antithesis of the entire era too you know yes. like it, it's such it's all wrapped up in there and roy i know roy doesn't like to hear that but that comic is absolutely genius because <laughs> how many times i like to hear it i just don't necessarily believe it. yeah okay <laughs> but seriously what makes it so genius steve will can attest to that is you can pick that up at any time of the day any year any decade from 20 years from now, 20 years in the past, and it's still fresh, and it's still fun, and it's still funny, but it's still great. Yes. There's not yes. many. How many single issues that actually has humor, seriousness, and just like it just captivates you? 
and you have the bulk. I, 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 there's not many comics like that, and that's why I think that is. If I had to put like my top twenty comics of all time, that is definitely in there. Definitely in that top ten. Top all, all the rest have the Hulk. <laughs> no, <laughs> but no, but it's it's just brilliantly done. And once again, that's why it's an honor to have my boy, my best friend in the whole world here. And, that uh, on issue fifty, Andy's our mascot. <laughs> you know, he's a guy, right? That's guilty by association. So, hey, Niall, any quick notes on being issue fifty? What, what, did we make it? We we were supposed to make it past five. No, we we made it. Heartbeat's good. Pulse is good. You know, we're gonna we're gonna keep on the journey. Yes, soon it's gonna be episode one hundred. Yes, I want to say I want to thank you and say what an honor it was to be asked to. Uh, to be on your 50th issue. I wish our, you know, technical aspects worked a little better. You could actually see me and John in the same frame and things like that. But you know, we, we got through it. Main thing was really seeing the uh, the wonderful artwork by George and everything, and I came through pretty well. So I guess we got through it all. Thank you very much. And I want to thank Niall and Steve, and I love you guys, and for for having this podcast with me. And I know life gets crazy out there, and this is always a good time to just. You know, sit back and talk about some fun stuff without all the craziness that's going out in the world. I tell people, issue Fantastic Four, issue 176, you will not be disappointed. That is the Marvel Universe as it should be done. And I love how the Fantastic Four are right there. That's just, it's brilliant. So, Steve, what do we got to say here? You know what? Let's wrap up. Thank you, Roy. And, of course, thank you, George Perez. Boom! Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.